and when one in the local weight sense or the linguistic sense is doing something that is new but is not necessarily detrimental to the religion. Like for example, having a roof on this masjid. This is a bid'ah. The roof in the time of the Prophet ﷺ for Masjid al Nabawi was the palm trees. But that doesn't mean we're committing a major sin by having a roof. There was no minaret in his time. There were no carpets. Carpets are from the Ottoman period. So when you go to Masjid al Nabawi today, Masjid al Haram, it's bare floor. Masjid al Nabawi, go right under the fine Turkish carpets or Iranian carpets, and bare floor, right? Masjid Qiblatain, all these masjids, bare floor. Why? Well, because carpets are from the Ottoman period. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, you've got carpets in masjid that's a major sin. When you begin to add to the religion, for example, stating that something should be done, which categorically goes against the religion, like for example, if uh, someone says uh, that on Fridays, people should not wear white jalabiyas because it's better to wear different clothes because we're going to go play football later. So don't wear white jalabiyas to Juma. Well, can't we wear the white jalabiyas to Juma and then change before we go to football? No, they've got to not be worn. But wait a minute, that's, that's adding to the religion because the Prophet ﷺ clearly told us that those things on Juma, a part of what should be done is the white jalabiyah and the white, white clothing. Bury your dead in the white. No, 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 bury them in black. Why am I? Because it's more elegant, it's easy to you know, attract heat. Right? No, that's an innovation. So innovation in which the religion is added to, its principle is changed. Right? That is where an innovation is blameworthy. But innovations that are linguistic, or in the sense that it's something that wasn't there before, in the sense that it's a utility going towards something. For example, tarawih. In the original time, before Ubay ibn Ka'ab became the imam over Salat al-Tarawih, people used to pray tarawih in small groups in the masjid. Two here, three there, one by himself, right? You find these things. But Umar ibn al-Khattab, he gathered the people together behind one imam, Ubay ibn Ka'ab. And when he did that, and he said, what a good bid'ah this is. Now, Umar was not saying, oh, blessed is major sin. What he was saying is, what I've brought about in continuing tarawih by gathering them all behind one imam, this is good. This is a good thing. And what he meant by that is, Salat al-Tarawih was still being prayed. People were reading the Quran as normal. But now it was behind one imam. That hadn't happened before. So this is the difference between permitted innovation and between impermissible innovation. Because there is a such thing as innovation that is permitted and innovation that's not. And the bid'ah that is permitted or mustahabba uh, is the bid'ah that we're talking about in the linguistic sense. And the bid'ah that's muharrama or sharra is the bid'ah that adds to the religion that's not permitted. Yeah? Is there another question? No? Yes? Uh, usually these Ghayn uh, Muqalladeen, they refer their narrations to uh, Imam Bukhari Rahimahullah and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah. So were these scholars also Ghayr Muqalladeen or they were not following any Madhum? Good question. The question is, were Imam Muhammad ibn <coughs> Ismail al-Bukhari and Taqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah, did they have madhabs or did they not follow madhabs as some people sometimes attach themselves to them? Imams al-Bukhari, Abu Dawood and Muslim were students of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and they were Hanbalis. And they are written in the books of history as Hanbalis. The earliest biographies we have on them are stating them as Hanbalis. And they themselves, Imam Bukhari, in one of his texts, uh, in fact, in al Johar al Muhassal by Imam Muhammad ibn Muhammad al Sa'di, who died 900 AH, he referred to a statement of Imam Bukhari where he referred to the Hanbalis as his companions, which means his, his colleagues. So that was his method. Imam ibn Taymiyyah, who lived from Taqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah, who lived 661 to 728 Hijri, he learned from his father, Shihab ibn ibn Taymiyyah, who learned from his grandfather, Majdu ibn ibn Taymiyyah. They came from a family of Hanbalis, and they were Hanbali scholars. The problem with the people that call themselves Ghayrul Muqaddideen or uh, Salafiya or Ahl al Hadith, whatever titles that they use for themselves, the problem with their way of thinking 
is most of the people that they attached themselves to had meth head besides themselves. The only people that don't have meth head are them. When you look at the people and say, well, who do you respect as ulama? Well, we respect Imam Taymiyyah, but they were Hanbalis. And we know he was because he said so in his books and so did other scholars. When he was buried, he's buried in the Hanbali graveyard. What about, well, Ibn Qayyim, he was Hanbali. Shaykh Abdul Qadr Jilani, he was Hanbali. Right? Imam Badr al Aini, he was Hanafi. There's no one that you can quote to us from the early generations that didn't have madhab. The only people that don't <coughs> are you, but then again, you're not scholars. Which is, what, which is the whole reason why we're having this discussion. <laughs> it's because they're not scholars. Yet they're telling other people that they're, it's wajib for them to become scholars to come to their own conclusions. And that's why we have to be careful. Do you have another question? Yeah, one question that uh, constantly props up to us is um, the, the issue regarding Aqidah and questions such as where is Allah? How do you respond to something like that? I mean, what's the understanding? Because this is something that completely confuses a lot of people. Okay. Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. First question, uh, the question is, what do we say about the people that are constantly coming and interrogating uh, and asking the question, where is Allah uh, to the Muslims? Our first reply to this question is this. Imam al-Barbahari, rahimahullah, in Sharq al-Sunnah said, when someone asks you, what do you say about Tawheed? Or tell us about Tawheed. Know that that person is either from the Khawarij or the Mu'tazila. So when someone begins the conversation, you've got peach fuzz, you're in the masjid, you look like a Muslim. In fact, they even saw you praying. Why would they need to then turn and inspect you as to whether or not you were Muslim? Because the hadith that they're quoting from Sahih Muslim, in which the Prophet wasallam asked the young shepherdess girl, where is Allah? And she said, fi sama, over above the sky, who am I, Rasulullah? Free her for she's a believer. The reason why he asked that question is because it was unknown whether she was a Muslim or not. Now, I'm in the masjid. It's 1,400 years later. You are making the assumption that my Islam is, you don't know whether I'm Muslim or not. You just saw me praying. You just saw me in Salat al jamaah You just saw me in the masjid. I'm minding my own business. I was doing dhikr. I've got the facial stuff. I've got every sign that you should take that I'm Muslim. And you're starting the question with the position that I'm not. And that's what the problem is. So when someone straight away starts with that, oh, well, uh, where is Allah? My question is, who told you I was kafir? I didn't say you were kafir. Yes, you did. Because that hadith, Imam an and others understand that that question is asked when you're not sure if someone is a Muslim or not. Now, let's say that they ask the question, well, I just want to be sure. Well, sure about what? Because if you're asking the question to me, do you know the answer to the question? Yes, then you're either from the Khawarij or the Mu'atezina. Do you not? Do you know the answer to the question? Well, no, then you're not a Muslim. Because a Muslim knows the answer to the question. And if you know the answer to the question, then you're quizzing me. If you're quizzing me, then you're from the Khawarij or the Short answer to it is this. There are seven places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is above the throne. There is a hadith in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, uh, in which the Prophet وسلم, mentioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke of the Arsh. Fine, we've got no problem with that. I don't think the believers have a problem with that. The dispute comes with what people attach to those hadith and verses. If you just read out that, Al Rahman al Arsh, you just read any ayah that has to do with that, no one's going to dispute that ayah. Alhamdulillah, it's there. The question comes when someone says, well, what does it mean? Or what do you say it means? Or what does this mean? That's where the question comes from. So our position is that we affirm those verses. But it's not for you to ask me and say, oh, well, where is Allah? Because the assumption within that question is that my Islam is in doubt or that I'm not a Muslim. And that's not halal to do that. It's not halal to do that. Yeah? Is there another question? Yes. Yes? Okay. Uh, my question is more uh, to do with the ending. Um, I don't know uh, if you're able to uh, answer a question that uh, has been bugging me for a while. Um, it's not uh, to do with the people who actually um, generally, you know, like they, they earn and they pay their tax or whatever. It's for those people self employed. Um, like a lot of people, um, they, they, <coughs> they are self employed and um, they.
day. So like when the tax year comes, end of the end of the tax year, they show an amount and you know they show less than what you, what they've earned. So by showing less than what they earn, they have to obviously hide the receipt. And then it goes far as um, like putting you to claim that oh, I'm earning this much, and so I, you know they claim for benefit as well. Right. Um, so my question is like you know to to be able to explain that whether it's you know, halal or haram, and okay. You can take into consideration people's situation, but sure. apart from people's situation, if they're genuinely doing that, that's fine. But if somebody is genuinely like, sh you know, say for example, sake of argument, they've earned twenty thousand pounds, mm -hmm. they're showing ten thousand pounds. So by showing ten thousand pounds, obviously they have to reduce the cost as well. Sure. And by reducing the cost and the round figure when it comes from that, they're getting some extra benefit from the government. Sure. So I don't know if you're able to. Uh, uh, the brother's question has to do with when someone is earning uh, a certain amount and they actually write down as part of their uh, tax return that they're earning less than that amount in order to receive benefits and also to avoid uh, the higher tax brackets that they're going to receive. This on the West Coast, I'm not sure what you call it here, on the West Coast we call this cooking the books. And what we mean by that is you are changing what is in the books of transactions and saying that something is the way that it is when it really isn't there. This is not permitted by the rules of Buyur, Kitab al Buyur, the book of transactions. It's not permitted to do this because if you are making an amount and you say that you are making less than what you are really making, this is deception. And this is a type of bay'ul gharam. It is where you are actually deceiving someone within a transaction. And it's not permissible to engage in that type of behavior within a transaction. It's not permitted to do that. It's one thing if they didn't know. But if they're knowingly doing so, that's not permitted for them to do that according to the rules of transactions. Because they're cooking the books. And it's not valid to cook the books or to simmer them or stew them or to bake them. Whatever they're doing with the books like that. It's not allowed for them to do it. And they shouldn't do it. And they should be advised in the best way possible because they are going to be held responsible for their transactions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask them. And can you imagine how that could turn someone further from Islam if the tax man or someone who might have been doing some personal YouTube research or library stuff about Islam uncovers this whole web of Muslims that are involved in tampering with their transactions. It's like a person that I knew in Nottingham in the UK who said, I was interested in Islam, but I was really thrown for a loop when I found out that as a private detective, most of the people behind credit card scams were Muslims. <laughs> that really had a negative effect on him. And we had to sort of work on it and say, you know, it's not all Muslims. He says, yeah, but everyone I meet, they do. And so we had to work on him. This is another reason why it's dangerous. Besides being impermissible, it also has a knock-on effect with showing people Islam because they think, well, Muslims are crooks. They do credit card scams and they, they cheat on their taxes. We don't want to be those people. <coughs> is there another question? You had one. Yeah, I've got a few questions. Uh, basically, the first question is to basically look key up. There's a verse of the Quran that Allah made in the right hand, talks about the hand of the yes. Quran. Obviously, I just want you to have uh, information on that, how to be true. Now, people, I don't know, we should take it literally or metaphorically or just take it as it is. Okay. The application of the Quran. Okay. The question is, um, is there a bizarre to do like charity events, stuff like that, etc., project things, and stuff like that? Like, like marches, protest yeah, marches, yeah. and things like that. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam rasulullah. There are two questions. One has to do with creed or i'tiqad. It centers around uh, verses like, بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَةً بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَةً Surah Al-Mahda, the fifth surah, I-63. <coughs> and other surahs similar to it that mention the yad, or the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the dual or plural form. <coughs> Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, uh, who's from the third age, has a very basic principle on this. We believe in it. We testify to the truth of it. 